using large scale data, this is something I had not anticipated when starting to work with these kinds of data sets 10 or 15 years ago. They allow a transparency and communication where I can just show people, look at this map. You can see the differences in opportunity for yourself across areas. You can form hypotheses yourself for why outcomes vary so much across places and start to test mentally in some sense what seems to be important. You don't need to take my word as an expert where I've estimated some econometric model that is very difficult for you to understand. Constructed in the right way, simple statistics with very large scale data can be a very powerful tool for communication. My name is Raj Chetty. I'm a professor of economics at Harvard University and director of Opportunity Insights. The way I think about social mobility is the idea that anyone should have the shot of rising up no matter what their background, what family they're born into, what the color of their skin is, what, their, uh, what zip code they live in. Uh, the idea that everyone should have a chance of moving up in society. That's what social mobility is about. That's how I think about economic opportunity more broadly. So the measurement of social mobility and economic opportunity is something that's been of interest for a long time to economists and many other social scientists. To what extent can you actually escape your origins? To what extent can you rise up? And traditionally, we've lacked data to be able to measure those concepts, looking at people over their lives, asking how their own situation relates to their parents' situation. But recently, with the availability of large-scale data, we're able to measure things like what fraction of kids go on to earn more than their parents did, or how does your own income correlate with your parents' income. These are different measures of the extent to which we have social mobility in our society. Aspiration in America, I think one of the cornerstone ideals of this country, what drew my own parents to come to this country and many other immigrants, is the idea that through hard work, any child has the chance to move up in the income distribution relative to their parents. Now, if we look at the data and ask what fraction of the kids in America actually achieve the American dream of moving up relative to their parents, we see that there's been a dramatic change over the past half century or so. If you look at kids born back in the middle of the last century, say, take a child born in 1940, we estimate that 92% of those kids, in real terms, adjusting for inflation, went on to earn more than their parents did. But over time, that notion of the American dream has faded. And children today who are turning 30 around now when they're entering the labor market, only about half of them are earning more than their parents did. In some sense, it's become a coin flip as to whether you're gonna achieve the American dream. So I think one of the most important changes in social science and in economics in recent decades has been the tremendous availability of data, big data to use the buzzword in Silicon Valley. Now, much as private companies like Amazon and Google improve the products they offer by mining large troves of data, our vision and increasingly many economists' vision is that we can use similar large-scale data to understand important economic and social policy questions. In the case of our research group, uh, what are the drivers of economic mobility and social mobility? How can we help more children rise up? And by using large-scale data sets, in our case, from things like anonymized tax records, census data covering the entire population, social network data from sources like Facebook, we can start to really understand the science of economic opportunity. What is it that gives some children much better chances of succeeding than others? Using big data, we're able to construct a number of different tools that understand, allow us to understand economic opportunity at a very granular level. I liken it to having a microscope for the first time to be able to study these questions. What does that microscope allow us to see? One example is a tool we've developed called the Opportunity Atlas, which you can access yourself by going to a website, opportunityatlas.org. And what that website will allow, uh, allow you to do is if you type in an address in the United States, you can zoom in and literally look at what kids' prospects of rising up were in that particular neighborhood. If you grew up, say, in a low-income family, uh, what are your chances of reaching the middle class or beyond? What are your chances of going to college? And so on. And going forward, we're able to construct these data not just for a given generation, but look at how things are changing over time in particular cities, in particular neighborhoods, thereby essentially monitoring what is happening to economic opportunity, and importantly, ultimately being able to use that data to study why it is that opportunity is so much more prevalent in some areas than others. So using data such as that from the Opportunity Atlas, we're able to compare places where kids have much better chances of rising up relative to others to understand the determinants of economic opportunity. A first simple finding 
is that there's a tremendous amount of variation in your odds of rising up, even across different neighborhoods within the same city. Often, you can go from one side of the street to the other side of the street, and you will see that if you look at the set of kids who are living there, who are growing up there, their odds of rising up and achieving a much higher income than their parents had vary dramatically depending upon the school they're attending, the exact neighborhood they live in, and so on. So we and others have now conducted a series of studies trying to understand why this is, looking, for instance, at kids who move between neighborhoods in the context of randomized experiments or quasi-experimental methods where we track siblings, for instance, who moved from one neighborhood to another at different ages. And one of the key findings that emerges is that a key driver of economic mobility is your childhood environment. The earlier you move to an area that offers better opportunities for upward mobility in childhood, the better your outcomes in the long run. If you move as an adult, we find very little impact on economic outcomes. Now, why is it that some of these places produce much better outcomes than others? There are a variety of factors that we and others have identified that seem to drive these differences. Things like you might expect, like the quality of local schools, access to higher education, but also very importantly, factors like segregation and social connections. How connected are you to higher income people who might provide pathways to jobs, change your aspirations, influence your career choices, and so on. So opportunity varies across many contours that we're able to investigate and characterize in the data. One important aspect is differences by space, difference across neighborhoods. There are quite large differences along other dimensions as well. For instance, by race, we find that black Americans in the US, even if they grow up in families at the exact same income level as white children, they have significantly poorer prospects of rising up and of achieving the American dream, even in the present day. So there are important differences by race, by ethnicity, uh, by immigrant versus native background, by geography. And all of these factors are somewhat interrelated in the sense that the same root factors about social connections, about the types of schools that people attend, the types of jobs they have access to, play into some of the differences that we're seeing by geography, by race, and on other dimensions as well. There are many factors that matter for economic mobility. One factor that we think is among the most important is social capital. And in particular, one notion of social capital that we call economic connectedness. So social capital is a term that's been around for more than 100 years. Uh, social scientists in many different fields have thought that notions of community, who you're connected to, who your friends are, might matter for a broad range of outcomes. Recently, with the advent of big data, we set about to measure social capital in a very granular way for every zip code in America using data from Facebook analyzing the relationships of 72 million people on the Facebook platform. And we constructed a number of different measures of social capital. It turns out that one of them that we call economic connectedness, the fraction of high income friends that low income people have, think of it as just a very simple measure of the degree of cross class interaction in a society. That measure of economic connectedness turns out to be the single strongest predictor of upward economic mobility that we or anybody else has identified. In particular, if a child grows up in an area where low-income people are interacting more with high-income people, as measured by Facebook friendships, they're significantly more likely to rise up in the income distribution themselves. So there are many mechanisms through which economic connectedness might influence social mobility. We don't know exactly why yet, but here are some candidate possibilities. The first, I think, most obvious one is that Many jobs in the US and many other countries as well are obtained through referrals, through a friend or through a connection who connects you to a potential employer. If you're connected to more high income people who have higher paying jobs, you yourself might get an internship at that firm. You yourself might get a job at that firm. That's sort of a mechanical way in which these connections might matter. But I actually think a deeper mechanism that may be very important is changes in aspirations that children have when they're connected to different sets of people. Uh, I think many of us, if we introspect, we can think of a teacher or a friend or a relative, a mentor, who shaped our own interests and shaped our own pathways. And similarly, you know, if you imagine a child growing up in a low-income family who's not connected to anyone around them who went to college or pursued a career in science or in business, they may just not even think of that as being on the radar screen. How do you even go about pursuing that pathway, let alone you know, taking the steps to apply to college and uh, you know, get the required recommendation letters and so on. When you're in that more connected community, 
I think your whole outlook might change, and we increasingly have evidence suggesting that these sorts of mechanisms are quite important, and that may be an important reason we're seeing this link between economic connectedness and economic opportunity. In our research group, Opportunity Insights at Harvard, which I direct, our goal is both to do basic research, as we've just been discussing, on the science of economic opportunity, but then ultimately to try to figure out what we can do on the ground to change economic opportunity going forward by changing policies, by changing uh, practices in society, and so on. We are organizing our approach to thinking about the policy implications of our finding by focusing on three buckets, uh, which I think follow naturally from basically the core thesis of what's emerged from our research, which is that the determinants of economic mobility are hyper-local. It's about the particular neighborhood and social community in which you grow up from something like birth till age 20 or so, and depends on factors like social capital and school quality and so on. If you have that worldview, I think you would naturally think about three different ways to try to increase economic mobility going forward. The first is to reduce segregation. If I know that a couple miles down the road here in Boston or in another city, there are much better opportunities for upward mobility, as we see in our Opportunity Atlas data, you know, the simplest thing you might think of is why don't we help more low-income families move to those higher opportunity neighborhoods, kind of desegregating the city to create opportunity. And that is indeed a viable approach, uh, one that we can perhaps take on a small scale. We can't possibly move everyone to a different neighborhood. Not everyone wants to move to a different neighborhood. But I think through better design of affordable housing policies, housing voucher policies, for instance, policies on which the U.S. already spends more than $50 billion per year, we're working on ways in which those policies can be better designed so that we actually give low-income families access to higher opportunity neighborhoods. So that's one set of policies on desegregation and moving to opportunity. Now we recognize that that has limits to scale. So a second approach is what we think of as place-based investment. How can we take the communities that are currently offering lower levels of economic mobility and turn them into higher opportunity areas? In some recent work, we're investigating programs that in, uh, invest billions of dollars to transform low, po low opportunity, high poverty areas into higher mobility places by tearing down high poverty public housing projects, uh, building mixed income housing, bringing access to new programs, and so forth. And we're, we're finding that those investments can really transform the trajectory of communities change the nature of social connections that kids are forming and create much better opportunities in a given place. In a sense, bringing opportunity to people where they currently live rather than moving people to opportunity. And I think there's a lot more to be done in that space, which could involve investing in schools, changing communities in other ways, and so on. And then finally, the third bucket I'd emphasize is changing access to education and higher education in particular. After kids are age 18, the most common touch point, of course, of intervention is the higher education system. At present, when we look at big data on colleges' contributions to economic mobility, similar to what we've constructed at the neighborhood level, we find that there are some colleges in America that offer kids great outcomes, places like Harvard and Stanford and other famous universities, um, but there are very few low-income kids who actually get the opportunity to attend those universities. At the other end of the spectrum, there are many colleges that enroll a lot of low-income students, often two-year colleges, community colleges, local institutions, but unfortunately the outcomes in terms of earnings after kids attend many of those colleges don't look so great. And so the big problem in my view is that we have very few edu higher education institutions in the U.S. and in other countries as well that both enroll many low-income students and offer good outcomes after college. And so we're doing a lot of work to try to figure out how we can give more kids access to those colleges that can really provide pathways to upward mobility and also improve outcomes at colleges that currently enroll many low-income kids but don't offer those pathways. And so that's a third policy domain where I think there's a real progress to be made. Our team focuses on the United States because that's where at present the data is most developed and you know, that's where we've focused our attention and have the best knowledge. But increasingly, we're supporting and trying to launch a global network of researchers who are doing similar work in countries across the world. And there are already a number of researchers who are doing similar work studying social mobility and its determinants 
in places ranging from India to Canada to Scandinavian countries to Brazil. And while there are many commonalities, things like social capital, the quality of schools, childhood environment, a lot of the themes we've touched upon matter in those contexts as well, there are also different fault lines of opportunity in different societies. While race is a big factor in the United States, in other countries it might be religion or it might be caste or it might be a divide between immigrants and natives. The importance of neighborhood factors versus more centralized factors varies depending upon the centralization of the government. So the precise ways in which this plays out differ across countries. And that's why I think it's very important to be studying these issues in a local context. And that's the power of big data that allows us to go beyond the traditional economics of kind of one size fits all. This is the theory that explains the whole world and allows you to kind of understand what matters contextually. But of course, there are some common themes uh, because all of society, you know, there's some common bonds in how society operates. One of the things I've valued about studying opportunity, particularly with big data, is that the goal of creating economic opportunity I found is pretty universal. It doesn't matter what side of the political spectrum you're on, where you come from. I think pretty much everyone agrees that no matter your background, you should have a shot of succeeding if you work hard. It shouldn't be determined simply by the color of your skin or, or the parents you had or where you happen to be born. And that unifying goal, I think, really brings people together. Now, people may gravitate towards different solutions to tackling that problem, and I actually think that's perfectly fine because this is a complex issue that's gonna require solutions from many different angles. But what I've found is when you start with a question that everyone cares about, there's sort of a shared goal of equality of opportunity, which I think, just as a note, is different from equality of outcomes, where there is an active debate about whether we should have more redistribution and less inequality and outcomes and so on. The context of opportunity, I think most people agree that opportunity should be widely distributed. And so that creates an entry point for policymakers to be interested in these issues, no matter the current political climate. I then find that using large-scale data, this is something I had not anticipated when starting to work with these kinds of data sets 10 or 15 years ago, they allow a transparency and communication where I can just show people, look at this map. You can see the differences in opportunity for yourself across areas. You can form hypotheses yourself for why outcomes vary so much across places and start to test mentally in some sense what seems to be important. You don't need to take my word as an expert where I've estimated some econometric model that is very difficult for you to understand. Constructed in the right way, simple statistics with very large scale data can be a very powerful tool for communication. And because of all that, we're actually finding that even in this polarized climate, there's a lot of interest among policymakers on both sides of the aisle here in the US, in other countries, in thinking about how we can advance economic opportunity. We're concretely seeing cities taking steps to change the way they structure programs, the way they structure affordable housing, access to education, um, the design of job training programs on the basis of the data our, our group is putting out. And so that leaves me optimistic uh, that we will be able to make a difference, especially at this time where I think these issues of opportunity are really at the root of a lot of the debates and the conflict that we're seeing in the US and beyond, where many people are feeling like they're left out of the progress that's being made and they wanna have a shot at that opportunity. So I think there's gonna be a lot of interest in these issues in the years to come and I'm hopeful that economists and social scientists will be able to contribute productively to that discourse.